All right, so my name is Andrea Antello. Good evening. Thank you for joining me. I know it's late and you guys are probably getting home from work and probably some of my attendees are trying to log in from their cars. So I appreciate you coming in to spend a little bit of time with me. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner, a family nurse practitioner. I work for Dr. Jeffrey Epstein, Dr. Anthony Bered, and Dr. Grana Kuka Epstein, all of whom are plastic surgeons, as well as hair transplant surgeons. And Dr. Kuka Epstein uh, Garana is also a functional medicine specialist. So um, combined with you know all of their knowledge and my knowledge, I've been able to be a sponge and take from different areas of their expertise and really have um, created a focus for myself on medical therapy or medical management of hair loss. And what does that mean? You know, obviously I work for surgeons, so there is a obviously a role, a big role for surgery, uh, as you know, but some patients either, you know, are, don't qualify whether they're not a candidate yet or are not interested in something as uh, invasive as a surgical option, um, or really just want to explore something a little bit less invasive, um, or depending on the type of alopecia that they've been diagnosed with, surgery is really not something that is, you know, it's not amenable to surgery. So I really took a, a vested interest in that because I felt myself, I have androgenic alopecia, and I always felt that, um, there was nothing more to offer, or I had not been any offered anything else other than Rogaine over the counter. Um, and the most aggressive thing was, you know, to do the men's one, but as a female and, you know, part of that requires lifestyle and compliance. I, myself, I already have thin hair. I didn't want to put something on my scalp every day that I wasn't sure that it was really going to work. And it was just kind of offered to the masses and not to say that Rogaine doesn't work, um, but we need to investigate a little bit further, you know, as to what's going on. And so that's where um, my role came in with the office to provide that service and that care to our patients, either before a procedure, even hold their hand during a procedure, if they are candidates for surgery, or even after a procedure. And so it's it's interesting because I've dealt with patients who they've had a procedure and then they bring their son or their daughter in who's young and they have questions and they become my patient and then we carry them through. So it's been really rewarding and I'm, I'm hopeful that you get um, a little bit of knowledge or information um, that you're looking for within my presentation, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and open that. So overview, a couple different things that you want to know as a patient or as a provider, or even, you know, if you're going into another clinic, not necessarily ours, um, or if you are a provider interested in maybe offering some more advanced services, um, this is the way that we approach, or I approach the way that we do things here in the office. So there's several different types of histories, right? So most people are just asking you your medical history, right? Do you take medication for cholesterol, high blood pressure, things of that nature. And, and then if you're going to a hair loss specialist, they're going to ask you a little bit about maybe your dad or your mom or your siblings, but we want to know more. So I'm not looking just at your medical history and, and just to know that maybe you have high cholesterol. I want to know what meds you're on because some meds can contribute to hair loss. A uh, very popular medication for cholesterol, a statin, uh, a torbostatin, rosuvastatin. Um, those are known to uh, cause some hair loss, of course. You know, they're necessary. Um, so we at times work with cardiology and, and try and find another avenue um, to kind of lower the cholesterol or knowing at least that information that you're on that medication, we can then kind of know, you know, knowledge is power and be able to focus on that since obviously we can't take you off of, you know, such an important medication. Uh, but that's one example. So that's medical history. Then family history. We're not just, you know, want to know about your mom and your dad, um, but your and your siblings, but also with age. You know, sometimes I get patients that come in that are 25 and they tell me their dad was bald by 17, you know, and so that's already something that's important to note because if they're just starting to recede, you know, while there is obviously a genetic component there, they're ahead of the ahead of the eight ball, if you will. So those are things, you know, we want to investigate that as well. Um, sometimes patients will say, no, you know, my mom has a full head of hair and she's in her 80s. Um, but she's always had really fine hair. So that doesn't mean that she doesn't have, you know, androgenic alopecia because she's, she might still have, I have a full head of hair, but I have very fine hair and I have diagnosed 
androgenic alopecia. So there's a spectrum there. So you want you want to be you know you want that investigation, um, that hair loss history. I want to know when it started. You know, and some patients will tell you, you know, it's I've been struggling since I was 18, and some have told me this just started two months ago, right? So there, there's a big difference there. And so we're investigating to figure out what has changed, you know, whether it's um, weight loss or weight gain, uh, you know, if you're a female, you know, you're a middle-aged female, if you're going through perimenopause, um, my male patients that maybe have just started taking some testosterone to help them in other areas that can cause hair loss. Um, particularly in the last three years, COVID-19, we saw a huge increase in hair loss two to three months after getting the virus. So all of these things, you know, we want to investigate timeline wise. I just don't want to know, you know, mom or dad has hair loss. You want to know, you want somebody to ask you more information. And then you're stressing your lifestyle because that's going to play a huge role. You know, if you just quit smoking, right, that's a great thing, but that can cause, you know, some hair loss from that stress. If you had a breakup, um, you know, a, a move, sometimes even the change in the water, right? If you move from another state, um, the change in the water can affect your hair. So sometimes we'll recommend a filter in your shower, things like that. You know, so we want to know all that information as well as part of the history. It's a much, it's an all encompassing history. So it does take quite a bit of time in consultation. And I want to make sure that I give you that time. Uh, the assessment itself, we do a physical assessment of the scalp. So I use something called a dermoscope. There's a photo of one there. Um, if you're a provider and you have that one, that that's fine. I use myself, I use Dermlight. Um, it attaches to the cell phone and to the iPad, so I find it easier to just clip on and carry around. But if you have a handheld one like that, that works just fine. And we're looking for any issues with the scalp, right? If you're gardening, you want to look at issues with the soil, right? That's what we're looking at. We want to look at skin abnormalities. You know, is there some um, seborrheic dermatitis? Do you have some psoriasis? Lots of, um, you know, maybe a suspicious mole that I want to look at and have that worked up for you or take a biopsy of. Uh, a lot of itching or redness. I might want to know if you have some irritation to maybe you're on the Rogaine over the counter and that causes a significant amount of irritation for you. I want to know that information. If, you, if you're female and you dye your hair uh, pretty regularly, I want to talk to you about that. Um, so all of those things I'm looking at, your scalp, um, something called a pull test. So gently, you should have somebody tugging on your hair, just a couple strands you want them to pull. Um, if you are going through something called telogen effluvium, which we'll talk about in a moment, it's a um, type of hair loss process, you will see multiple hairs come out. And my female patients, I'm, just, I'm not just talking about, you know, when you touch your hair and you see one fall out, you know, hair falling out is, is, is somewhat normal. Uh, 50 to 100 hairs a day can still be considered within normal limits um, for hair loss, depending on the cycle of, you know, the phase of hair growth that you're in. But I mean, significant hair loss that's coming out in clumps, you know, we want to know that information. So we'll do a light pull test. Um, as I mentioned, dermoscopy. And then my female patients, I'll check your the girth of your ponytail, um, particularly if you start telling me that you've noticed a lot of loss, you know, towards the back, um, so that I can get a baseline measurement. Investigation. Now, every patient, every single patient we order labs on, or we offer that service, some patients decline, um, depending on the insurance programs that they have, um, or if they've just gotten a workup with their primary care physician. And so we'll take a look at what you've had done and see if we need to add anything to that. But in general, we're looking for other causes of hair loss um, because hair, you know, hair is attached to you. So anything that happens to you happens to your hair. Um, so if you maybe have a thyroid abnormality or your hormones are out of whack or you're vitamin deficient and particularly zinc or vitamin D, um, those can cause some hair loss, um, iron, um, ferritin, which is iron storage. All of those things can cause hair loss. And sometimes, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. And this, these are things that are not necessarily run all the time on a, a standard, you know, annual physical. Trico test, genetic testing. I know a lot of patients uh, or, or attendees are probably on here for this. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. By no means am I a geneticist, but we do do quite a few of those in our office. And I have found that it has been extremely helpful in providing other options to patients that they didn't feel like they had any others or they felt like maybe they had exhausted all options and had nowhere to turn to. Um, so it, we'll talk about what, what that test is, what it does for us. Um, some, I'll show you some photos of some real life patients of mine with some results, some realistic results. Um, none of the patients that I will show you have had a transplant. They have all been either topical, you know, they've all been um, trichotest patients. 
um, have all been either on topical medication, oral medication, or PRP, or laser. So they're all on medical therapy. Um, micronutrient or heavy metals panels. If it's indicated, if you're, you know, our, our in-depth history shows me that maybe you need to, we need to investigate further into that. That's where that functional medicine that Dr. Kuka um, talks to me about quite a bit, and she's very well versed in that. She'll, she'll, you know, help me out with that so that we can investigate further and see if there's anything else going on. Um, also, like change in diet and things like that. And then we come up with a plan. So whether that's oral medication, topical medication, as I mentioned, laser, PRP, microneedling, if um, I have a patient who maybe is trying to get pregnant or one of some of my very older patients who really cannot afford to get on anything invasive um, or medication due to, you know, the substantial medical history, even scalp massages and hair care and hygiene, all of those things, you know, change in diet and lifestyle, stress management, all of those things will help, you know, and sometimes that's all a patient needs is for someone to listen and give that advice. So again, the consultation is the most important part. If you're going to um, a hair loss clinic and they're spending, you know, just five minutes with you and not asking you any of these types of questions, you should be concerned um, only because you want to make sure that they're, they know what they're talking about, you know, um, and we are living in an age where a lot of patients are losing hair. And so they just want to go to their primary um, I, I myself would probably do that too, if I didn't work in this field. Um, and then, you know, you just get told minoxidil and that's, you know, the best that's out there, um, over the counter. And so I want you to know, and the reason why we're doing this is because there are other options. Um, I want to know also GYN history for my female patients. So you have normal menstrual cycles. Maybe you have PCOS. Uh, did you have a difficult time getting pregnant or have you been having a difficult time getting pregnant? All of those things are very important for us to kind of understand a little bit of a pattern or create a pattern. Um, I also want to know what you think is causing your hair loss. Many a times you, you can figure it out on your own if you just have someone to bounce ideas off of and we go through, you know, your life. We go through trying to figure out what's been going on lately and we can kind of pinpoint maybe sometimes we can't, but sometimes we can pinpoint some things that really, you know, strike us. You'll, you'll see my face change um, in consultation. And at the end, we'll kind of talk about it and see if maybe that's where that's coming from. Um, sometimes our consultations can get very emotional, you know, depending on, on what you've been through. And so I want to make sure that you get that attention that you deserve and that we kind of, you know, go through it together. Um, for my younger patients and some of my male patients, I talk a lot about compliance uh, because in general, you tend to be a little bit less compliant with doing something daily. So I want to make sure that you understand um, the implications of what we're going to start when we start treatment. What do you think is going to be easiest for you? Many a times that's an oral medication. Very popular for my male patients to do finasteride, which is Propecia, uh, Dutasteride, which is Avidart or oral minoxidil, just because if you're already taking something oral, you know, it's very easy to just add that to your morning routine instead of having to put something on your scalp. Um, my female patients tend to have a little bit better of a routine going um, typically in the nighttime with, you know, our face creams and all that stuff. So I want to make sure that we're setting realistic expectations on what your goals are and that you know what the expectation is um, from us, you know, because this is I'm not I'm not with you every day. And hair is something that takes quite a bit of time. If any of my patients that are on here that have had a procedure, you remember that, you know, it takes four months to even see a hair grow from a transplant. And that's very invasive. So imagine, you know, something, a pill or a topical takes quite a bit of time. So most of my patients are on this journey with me for several years. Um, I have been with Dr. Epstein six years and I have patients that I'm still seeing um, for maintenance just once a year at this point. But um, in the beginning, I'm seeing you every, maybe four months for reassurance up until we get to a point where either we pivot and make some adjustments to your treatment or just to follow up and take some photos, which are super important um, to make sure that you are feeling uh, reassured and that you're excited about the results. And lastly, not every provider or office is equipped to treat hair loss. You have to know when it's time to refer. For us, for example, there is, we're going to talk about types of hair loss now. There are some types of hair loss that we end up referring to the University of Miami. We work very closely with them and their dermatology department, uh, particularly Dr. Antonella Tosti and Dr. Maria Mateva, because um, there are some medications, you know, that that in our office, you know, we're not 
able to prescribe um, with certainty only because you will need um, additional workup, for exact, uh, example, jack inhibitors and Plaquenil, things like that. You know, we don't take insurance, so you need to go through that, those proper channels, get your eyes checked, your liver checked things like that. So we work very closely with them um, when it's something that we feel that it would be for in the best interest of our patient to also see a specialist um, at the university level. And we have plenty of dermatologists that refer to us once they feel that they've reached a point where the patient now needs to see somebody who specializes in hair loss. So types of hair loss, I started there, the most common ones that we see, although those scarring alopecias are starting to get more and more common. Um, with, um, you know, now that we're doing more biopsies and things like that. Um, androgenic alopecia is your genetic hair loss, your male pattern hair loss, or female pattern hair loss. Women and men tend to um, lose hair differently, you know, where men tend to recede at the frontal temporal recessions and then in the crown. Women tend to have a diffuse hair loss here in this top part, and they complain of a widening part. Um, so the hair loss is different, the pattern, but it's still considered the same branch of hair loss. Telogen effluvium, that is a abrupt onset of massive amounts of shedding, usually occurring two to three months after whatever the trigger was. Sometimes in consultation, we can figure out why. Sometimes prior to consultation, just when I read, you know, the intake as to why the patient is coming in, um, we can figure out why or the patient already knows and just wants to get additional support. That's a tricky one because if you did nothing, it would likely stop on its own, but obviously patients don't want to do nothing, which is why they're coming to see us because it can be very distressing. You know, I myself has have had a few bouts of it and it's very uncomfortable to see how much hair is coming out, particularly in your brush, like in the photo or in the shower. And some of my male patients as well um, have noticed this very high increase now after COVID and now with the weight loss medications that are out there, um, significant weight loss can throw you into this telogen effluvium, um, you know, phase. And that does take some time to get better on its own or with treatment. So we do see quite a bit of those patients. Scarring alopecias are types of alopecias that are autoimmune. So usually on consultation, when I have that dermoscope, that I showed you in the photo, if I see anything funky, um, you know, we're trained obviously to, to look for some signs, whether it's some inflammation around the follicle or some patchiness, some, some milky white discoloration. Patients sometimes will come in and say, you know, I started losing hair like a headband or, you know, this, the texture on my skin feels different. I'm really itchy. I'm burning. Um, those are kind of trigger words that lead me to investigate further. And if we do need to do a biopsy to confirm that information, I can do it for you that day in consultation and get a, a you know, a, a definitive answer because that will kind of guide our treatment based on the type of scarring alopecia. And in those cases, they're not always amenable to a procedure. Um, Dr. Epstein and Dr. Kuka Epstein has, have developed their own protocol for that, um, again, working with the University of Miami, and then trying to establish some, some blood flow um, using fat, stem cells from fat, um, and things of that nature, which I won't go into too much detail, but those are all things that, you know, we have worked on um, in our office to make sure, again, we want to provide options for patients. That's our main goal, so that patients understand that we care and it's personal for us. Um, alopecia areata, very common. Also, stress induced, usually, um, whether it's stress on the actual hair or stress, emotional stress, you know, patches, little patches of hair loss um, that does get better typically with just some steroid injections or some topicals, which we have a formula for. Um, so, that is usually something that it can reoccur, but it is something that we treat quite frequently and it does um, usually is self limiting once treated. Uh, and then alopecia totalis, I haven't seen one of these in a bit, but it is um, unfortunate. It ends up from areata, you end up losing the entire, basically all of your hair. Some patients even lose body hair and things of that nature. So that obviously is autoimmune and requires quite a bit of patience. Um, but we have developed, again, protocols and things that we can do for those patients, although it is a little, the most rare of what we see. So this is just so that you guys kind of has a refresher. As I mentioned, females and males will lose hair differently. And so you want to make sure, obviously, there's never a wrong time to come in, um, but there is a right time, you know, if if you're starting to lose hair, you know, if you're, you're coming to me, uh, uh, 
uh, Norwood type seven, there's not as much as I can do for you as if you're coming in any, you know, any of the options on the left or even the top right. Um, once you're getting to seven, you know, we're, we're limited on what we can do for you as far as getting you to goal. We can always get you a result, you know, but getting you to your goal is something that we want to make sure that we we help you understand and we prioritize, especially if you're a surgical candidate, we want to make sure we prioritize what it is that we're going to focus on um, because you have to, you know, have some hair in order to move that hair. And with medical therapy, you have to have so, you know, you have to have some life follicles in order for that medical therapy to respond. In female patients, again, most of our patients are coming in between a 1A and a, maybe even a 2A. Once we start to get a little wider and more advanced there, it also can get difficult just because most women will, will complain that they're, you know, thin all over. Um, and so we really need to prioritize again on some areas. This is just a little bit of information on the cycle of hair so that you understand, particularly with telogen. Um, so we have several phases, you know, that some, some consider they're even a fourth phase, which is an exogen phase, but the first phase is antigen. That's your growth phase. Um, that's when the hair starts to grow. You have a lot of nourishment. Um, catagen is your transition. It detaches from your nourishing blood supply. And then telogen is your resting phase. So that is going to be where the hair dies and falls out. And so what happens in that telogen phase is the hair will fall out and patients, you know, in this telogen effluvium, more hairs than not are in that telogen phase. And so what throws you into that excess telogen phase? Some sort of stress. And so we're trying to investigate that further. Um, so that's when we really want to focus on finding out um, what it is, if we can, and, and helping the patient understand that telogen that that fallout is somewhat normal now when you get into this telogen effluvium which is more hairs than the usual which is when patients start saying I've always been a shedder but this is next level right and so that's where we like to talk to patients about the cycle of hair so that you can yourself can understand because knowledge is power and it's gonna um, make you feel more comfortable with the situation you know the, the hair fall so how does it work for us? You know, hair loss, you know, we usually see patients coming in, their hair loss started in their early 20s or 30s. Sometimes patients even come in in their, their early 40s, still looking, I'm talking about medical therapy, right? Um, and they told me, they tell me, you know, I, I, I was having some hair loss. I started minoxidil or finasteride. I've been on it for some time. I don't really know that I see much improvement, uh, but I've been on it for so long, I'm afraid to stop. Or, you know, maybe it stopped the progression of hair loss, but I'm not really noticing any improvement in my hairline. It's just kind of been the same for so long, right? So then what happens is they stop using it. Either they forget, particularly with topicals, you know, they use it like once a week, which that and nothing is almost the same. So they forget or they experience side effects. And so either they're living with these side effects, which I hate to hear, you know, because again, we have options for you. Um, or they don't know if it's working, so they stop. So then they stop and their hair loss worsens. They have no consistent treatment. They have no provider to guide them. And then in between that, you know, because we don't live in a vacuum, you can have these stressful episodes that cause telogen effluvium, which is that shedding episode I talked about. So if you have genetic hair loss and then you have this stressful shedding episode, you know, that, that although they're two different things, you know, they're not, they're not, um, independent of each other, you can still go through stress and have this genetic hair loss. And it can make your genetic hair loss a little bit worse because you're shedding. Even though you regrow the majority of your hair from the telogen episode, it still is something that's very distressing to someone who already has unlimited um, hair supply or very fine hair to begin with. So the patient gives up and either shaves their head fully or commits to a wig. My female patients come in with a hair piece on or my male patients or they find providers who care and give them results. Um, not necessarily, again, always to goal, we do our best, but depending on how, you know, when you come in and what, what it looks like when you come in and what you're looking for, you know, we, we, we have a reasonable chance of giving you something that you're happy with. So let's talk a little bit about triclosis. I see some questions coming in. I think I'm just going to get to them in the end so we can just get through this together. Okay, so hang with me. Um, so Trichotas, it was in, uh, started in Europe, made its way down to the U.S. We've been using it since it was in Europe. 
Um, you know, it's uh, analyzing both genetic and other extrinsic factors, you know, which is what we like about it, because those things are important. As I mentioned to you in consultation, we're looking at everything, you know, we don't just want to um, look at the surface level, because if hair was sitting on the table, it'd be much easier to treat, but it's attached to you. So everything that happens to you happens to your hair, and we want to know. Um, so if there's any underlying factors, if you have already a thyroid condition or you're on testosterone replacement, or you have a heavy menstrual cycle or, um, anything like that, it's going to, we're going to ask you those things. We want to know how much sleep you're getting. If you work in it with toxic materials at work, um, you know, the, the kind of stress level you're under, we want to know all of those things as part of the treatment plan. And then it's a simple, it's painless, it's a saliva swab. We can do it in the office for you. We offer that service as well as we can drop ship that to your home. For those patients that are somewhat tech savvy, um, you go on the on the, the website, it comes a little card and you fill out your questionnaire and you make sure that the number that it comes with is the same number um, that you're putting in your demographic sheet for. And then we send you a prepaid shipping label and you send it to the uh, testing lab. It's in Texas now in the US takes about 10 days to get the results, um, maybe a little bit less, but it does take us also some time to analyze those results and get you an appointment. Most of my appointments with patients are virtual unless they're an, you know, an, a, a local patient. Uh, but I try to do them virtual just because, you know, most patients, if they just came in or just had a procedure, they maybe don't want to come back to the office for that. So I try to get it um, done as quick as possible so that we can start treatment um, and, and get that going. So this is also from the um, GX Sciences, which is the U.S. office. This is um, where how they analyze, again, the 16 SNPs, and they get 48 different genetic variations that are analyzed, and they're looking at mutations. All of us have variants, right? Variants are kind of like um, metabolism, right? Everybody has one, but sometimes some a little slower, a little faster, right? And so we're looking to see what variants you might have in your genetics that gives us information about what medications you're going to have a better response to. So this is not like an ancestral thing. This is not telling me, you know, if you come in and say, you know, I don't have anyone in my family with genetic hair loss and I want to do this test to see if maybe my great, great aunt Sally gave this to me. This is not the test for you. It's not ancestral. It's not going to tell me where your hairline is going to end up. If that test does come out, it would be amazing, but I don't think it will ever happen. Um, but this gives us more information. This is looking to individualize treatment. So this is going to give us oral medication options, topical medication options, um, maybe some predispositions for vitamin deficiencies, depending on maybe how slow or fast the transport of vitamins are into the cell. So again, this is genetic, right? This is looking at your genes. Then we also use the lab work that we order because those are going to be real-time values, right? That's going to tell me if you have a genetic predisposition to low vitamin D, right, based off of trico tests. Well, you're already taking vitamin D. If I were to draw your labs right now, maybe they're fine, right? And vice versa. So we're looking at two different things. We're looking at serum, which is blood, and then we're looking at genetics. So together we get this very individualized overall view of you to be able to kind of guide our treatment plan. And that's what you want, right? You don't want to, you know, most patients don't want to do the same thing that their neighbor's doing. I mean, if it works and it's cheaper, Yes, great. But in general, if you're going to do that investigative work because you've tried a few different things or you're making quite an investment um, in getting a procedure or you're just so tired of hearing the same kind of thing, you want somebody who's going to tell you, you know, I want to try and individualize this for you. Um, so this is an example of what I see as provider as a provider and you see as a patient. I'm very transparent. I send my patients everything. Um, that I get. Again, like I, the disclaimer is I'm not a geneticist. I do this all day long, but there are times where even I don't understand the allele process. Um, and so I work with the geneticists at um, GX Sciences to, you know, usually that's why we require at least 10 days, because if there's anything that I see that maybe is funky in the report, I want to make sure that I understand it perfectly to explain it to, to you. Um, but I am very transparent with our reports and we, we believe in that. Um, so this is the best way for patients. I always tell patients to pull up this, these two pages. This is a sample report. This is not an actual patient. There's no 
you know, hippo information on here. It's just a sample so you can see. So it gets, all the variants get read, right? And you're going to, you would get that report also about all the different gene interpretations, you know, your salt. I saw somebody ask about the sulfur transferase. We don't do the minoxidil response test because this is more accurate. Um, and so this is looking at um, the different genes, you know, associated with all these different categories. And then it puts it into a, um, a page like this with percentages so that we as providers and you as patients can see what percentages of things you, you might respond, what percentage you might respond to. So if a patient is kind of on the fence about finasteride or dutasteride, given some of the potential side effects, and then they see, man, you have between an 80 and a 97, you know, 86 to 97 percent that you might have a response to, that's something you might want to try as opposed to just not trying it because of maybe the three to 5% chance that you have some of the side effects. And now, if you don't want to do oral medication, we have the option of putting in a topical, which is going to, um, a compounded topical, which is what I do quite frequently, probably 85% um, of my patients are now switching to topicals. Um, and this kind of avoids the potential for side effects and still gives you, you know, a similar result. Um, the ones that are in red are anti-inflammatories. That's because this particular patient did not indicate that they had some of those autoimmune uh, hair loss patterns that we talked about um, that would activate anti-inflammatories as one of the things that we're trying to do with um, um, scarring alopecia is decreased inflammation. So that's why those are in red, as well as arginine and caffeine, probably in the genetic report. I don't have it in front of me because, again, it's a sample it um, did not uh, recommend that for this patient. And then I wanted to show you the vitamin option because I do have patients that do do trigo tests just for this option. Um, for my patients that are very interested in knowing what vitamins would be beneficial to them um, and are really trying to do more of a homeopathic approach um, that are just trying to do again, scalp massages and different types of serums. And I have a lot of patients that are interested and I even compound with you know, rosemary oil or peppermint oil and some of these other vitamins that, you know, patient might have a genetic predisposition to having a decreased, um, a, a decreased level in, I, we can use this. Um, again, obviously it's vitamins. It may not be as um, quick for results uh, as some of obviously our, our pharmaceutical agents, but it is something that for patients, again, that are maybe trying to get pregnant or are really not trying to take any other additional medications for whatever personal reason, um, I do like to focus on this option as well. So these are some photos. They're realistic. I chose a couple different, you know, I could, I could do this all day, but I chose a couple different patients that had different hair loss patterns to show you um, truly the results that you get, you know, I'm not going to show you somebody who had zero hair and now has a full head of hair because that would be more of a transplant approach. I do have patients that have had a transplant that are also on medical therapy and medical therapy has helped them in addition to a transplant, but I didn't find that fair to show you all when we're just doing a medical therapy um, presentation because I want you to know where we can get with just medical therapy. This particular patient was on topical minoxidil over the counter for over 15 years um, and was one of those that told me I'm afraid to stop because I'm not sure that it's working. But once trico test rolled out and we sent an email to our database, he wanted to come in and just try. And he has been thrilled. He said he'll never stop. He's never seen such growth. And he still has a ways to go. When he came in on that picture on the left, he was not a candidate for a transplant. And now he is. So he's thrilled about that because he has enough coverage there in the crown with his own hair to be able to um, get him a nice result in the crown area. This is a younger patient. Again, I like to show different demographics. This patient came in with a lot of miniaturization of those baby fine hairs, which, you know, as patients, that's usually what brings uh, you all in because those hairs, you know, tend to be um, so fine that you really see scalp uh, like, like this patient. And he was very concerned and knew that those hairs were on their way out. And he committed to treatment and he has been on treatment for probably about seven, seven and change months um, and has a pretty impressive result thus far, I think, uh, would you agree? Um, you know, he still has a ways to go. He's very young. So this is a commitment that until something more permanent comes out, he likely will be on. Um, and it's, it's interesting because these are the patients that I love um, when they come in because they're like, oh my gosh, I was really afraid. <laughs> 
that I was going to lose all my hair. Um, and then I would never be able to do a transplant or, you know, I'm so young, this particular patient's, you know, very young and, um, he's very happy. And there was a period there where he stopped for a little bit and then lost some progress and got back on and was able to regain that progress. Um, so not that I condone that behavior, but it kind of was validating for me as a provider and for him as a patient to know that we're, you know, this genetic, um, test is really helpful to, you know, because we're, we're showing, we're seeing that, you know, the fruits of our labor. This is a patient that had telogen effluvium, her befores are on the top. So telogen effluvium tends to really affect this hairline, you know, and it, and it recedes quite a bit. And so you can see she has, um, she was a redhead before, but she um, has quite a bit of recession and a lot of, you know, see where you can see through, you know, all the way she was, she came in complaining of not feeling um, comfortable wearing a ponytail or anything like that and wearing her hair back. And so we started her on laser and um, a topical treatment. And she, you know, this was growth that she saw. I wanted to show you like a, a, an early growth. She has continued to improve, but you can see those hairs, you know, that are growing here. Um, and the hairline on that right side is now much more covered where when you pull it back, you don't see back into her scalp. Um, and that was probably over the course of about six to eight months as well, because we need that telogen episode to end. You know, we can start treatment, but that's really just going to help stop that um, telogen episode or at least help the patient through that. And then we need to focus on regrowing what we've lost. So, so this, this can take a while too, but this was some early growth and she was very pleased with. And this is another patient with quite a bit of genetic hair loss. Um, the top picture is when she came in to see me, we still have a ways to go, um, but she is doing um, topical treatments only. She did a little bit of PRP as well, but in general, what has really worked for her has been topicals. In fact, she also was one patient that stopped for a little bit and, and restarted, you know, during the pandemic, um, she stopped and, and lost a lot of her progress and ended up pretty close to what she was looking like when she came in. And she's back to, you know, a, a much happier place and feeling more comfortable about, you know, what it looks like. And so these are, these are just, again, some, there's a lot, you know, um, and there's different goals for patients and there's different things that bring people in that bother them. And so I wanted to give you guys kind of a spectrum, a realistic view of what can be done with just a topical, a dropper, a dropper. There are some vitamins that we do recommend for those patients that are interested in vitamins only. These are the two that we sell here in the office. Um, in general, Dr. Epstein usually recommends Viviscal Pro as his first line. I think that it's been around a little bit longer and we, I think it's more of a compliance thing. Patients tend to do better with the fact that they're only two pills. Nutrafol, I think it's great also, but it is for quite large pills. You have to remember to take it with a fatty meal. Um, so we have them both. What I like about Nutrafol versus Viviscal, you know, the pro to Nutrafol is that there is a women's balance option, which is for perimenopause or postmenopausal women, and there is a men's line, you know, so it really tries to target, you know, and the, the different ingredients, whether it's saw palmetto or ashwagandha or they, you know, they, they, they help with some of the side effects of perimenopause or aging in a man and things like that, libido. So some of my patients that maybe have some, you know, feel that they have some side effects from Propecia, I will recommend something natural like getting on Nutrifol Men's. Uh, because some patients have felt that it has helped with their libido. Um, but in general, either one of these is good. I myself use Viviscal, but either one of these are, are options. Make sure the Viviscal is Viviscal professional, okay? Other things, laser light therapy. Dr. Epstein does private label two different types of laser caps. Uh, helps to slow down active shedding. So I like this in my telogen effluvium patients. Um, as I mentioned, that aggressive hair loss, um, I like it because it is not going to typically add to the hair loss, where even starting a topical right in the moment when you're in the thick of the shedding, minoxidil can cause a little bit of shedding when you start it. Um, so this tends to help with that. I also like it for my patients that are on topicals because the one of the mechanisms of, of action is that it's going to increase blood flow to the scalp. So whatever you put on your scalp, if you put the laser on after, it's going to help with penetration of whatever you're putting on your skin and help to circulate that medication. So it's going to thicken your existing hairs, providing a fuller appearance for the patient. And also if you use it post-transplant, I think if Doc had it his way, every patient would um, purchase one post-transplant because of course the same theory applies, this increase to, in blood flow um, will support the transplanted hairs as well as your native hair. 
Um, my job is to help you keep your native hair um, and obviously help you through the transplant. But but when patients have a transplant and are also on medical therapy, we work in tandem um, to make sure that your native hair also stays. <clears throat> PRP, so not all PRPs are equal. We use M sites in our office. Uh, for those of you that are not local, if you, you know, I have plenty of patients that, that are from out of the state or out of the country and they call and they obviously can't make it to our office, which is fine. Um, and I usually recommend to find a provider that uses M site. It's a double spin system. Um, we have done the studies on the types of platelet concentration and we are getting much more. Um, maybe seven times baseline, sometimes even more than that. Um, some offices that are just offering this service that maybe also draw blood for other things and are using their centrifuges, you know, in a regular standard tube. It's not something that you want to be using. We um, only use the centrif the centrifuges only use only use for PRP. And as you can see, that's the actual vial that we spin. We draw quite a bit of blood. Um, and that's the vial that we spin it in. So the amount of um, concentrated platelets that we're able to get is outstanding. Um, I just wanted to give you information about PRP itself. So the working definition of it is a minimum of 1 million platelets in a 5 ml volume of plasma. So if you're not getting that, if, you're, if your provider is not able to tell you that they're getting that, then you're not getting platelet-rich plasma at all. So it would be like injecting whole blood and just putting it in there. Um, you know, it was originally, its intention was for wound healing and promoting new cell growth and, uh, and, and for anti-inflammatory properties in several areas of medicine. That's why it's used in orthopedics and other things, and even in, in aesthetics um, for the face to heal uh, acne scarring and things of that nature. In hair restoration, there's no established protocol. They, you know, in our office, if they'd say, if you ask 10 people how to do it, you might get 11 answers. Um, but, but we ourselves, so we've come up with our own protocol for the standards of practice, how frequent we do them. We do use microneedling for all of our um, standalone treatments and for our transplants, we do with every single patient prior to uh, Dr. Epstein making the recipient site. So that's the form of microneedling that we use for the transplanted patients. Um, and then we make sure that we, again, individualize how we're going to do the PRPs, how often and things of that nature, because if a patient is doing just PRP, it's very, very imperative to stay on top of those treatments as opposed to maybe a patient like a lot of my college patients that are doing their topicals or their oral medication or their laser and they come for holidays, you know, so I make sure that I block out a section of time during um, spring break, during Christmas break and during summer break for my college, my, I call my, my college kids that are coming in um, and they're coming in home to Miami and they're going to be here for a certain amount of time so that I can um, get their PRPs done. So they may be coming three times a year or twice a year or something like that. This is um, the microneedling device I use is the one under that mechanical category, the medical, the medical one. So there's manual ones, which you can do at home. Um, mechanical, there are cosmetic ones that are usually used for the face and then medical grade ones. Um, and that are actually, this one's actually from Candela, which is a very reputable device company. So I use their Exceed microneedler. I like it for hair because it has a tilting plate so I can get in and out and around through the um, hair without um, so, so much transection. And I can um, change the depth and the speed of the needles. So I'm not looking for you to come out like a bloody mess. And if you're doing this at home, I caution patients about doing it at home because you know if you're if it's hurting so much and you're bleeding down your face, it's too much. And you can damage the scalp. You can actually cause scarring. You can transect the hairs. And so I like to see, um, depending on how much fat that patient has, right? And, and there are studies that the amount or the degree or advance, the degree of the advanced hair loss is directly correlated to the amount of fat that you have, right? And so you want to make sure that you're not going so, so deep with this device that you're causing these internal, you're causing scarring, right? You're causing, now you're causing trauma. This is supposed to be a micro injury, a very soft injury um, because our platelets are activated on that and it stimulates collagen production. And our body is made to when there's a small paper cut, right? Or anything to heal itself. Um, and so that's the thought process behind microneedling. So I'm not looking to 
you know, machete your scalp. And so I want to make sure, you know, we looked for the right device to make sure that we could do that for you, uh, obviously without um, so much discomfort. So that's the device I use. So that's it. This is the information for the different websites. Um, we have uh, Def Jeffrey Epstein, Dr. Jeffrey Epstein, foundhair.com, and then also the Women's Center for Hair Loss. So female patients, um, we see on certain days of the week if they're just looking for medical therapy, because again, as you can see in my consultations, you know, they, they take quite a bit of time. Um, we do do extensive blood work and, and we talk with the patient for a long time. So um, depending on what you're looking for, you can go to any of those websites and you can put in the uh, inquiry box and they will get filtered to me. Um, and then that's my person, my, you know, my work email address. I am very... Uh, available to my patients as much as I can be. I am a mom, um, but I, I try to make sure again that that sentiment about this being very personal to me, that it carries through um, to my patients um, so that you guys feel that there uh, is an, another person on the end of the um, consult table that really does care. Okay, let me look at your questions now. All right. So what exactly is microneedling? So microneedling, that's a device. Again, you have that dermal roller, which they're sold, you know, over the counter. You can get on Amazon or anywhere. We're going to start carrying one in our office as well for home use. Uh, we're just trying to find the right one, again, to have avoid patients having excess trauma because there are different needle lengths. And basically the, the dermal roller is basically you're going to pass it. It's got different needles at different lengths and you're going to pass it over your head. And it's creating these little pinpoint like micro channels almost. Um, and it can be a little bit painful. It shouldn't be too painful or it's too deep. Um, in the office, we have that medical one that I, that I mentioned. Um, and so we use that one uh, in the office, but there is a home use. And again, the thought process behind that is to create this micro trauma um, and also these micro channels when I do the PRP, uh, but this trauma to activate the platelets and also stimulate collagen production and healing. So it is part of um, some of the hair loss protocols in a lot of the you know established hair loss offices. Does laser light therapy work in scarring alopecia? It depends on the type of alo scarring alopecia, but in general, um, it's not my first line uh, because it depends. I would have to evaluate your scalp. Uh, it depends on the type, the degree of the scarring um, and the amount of inflammation that you, you see. Um, sometimes PRP is something that can be helpful for that inflammation as well. If you have tried obvious, the obvious choices like Kenalog or even topical um, tacrolimus. Um, so those are some of the things that we tend to do, use first. Um, but the, it it can be an option. It can be an option. It depends on um, the type and the degree. Um, recently, huh? Okay, so some shock loss. So shock loss uh, post procedure. So this is a question about a patient that had a transplant. Um, very very common. Very, very common post-procedure. Um, remember that we're removing hair. It's, if this is, a, this is an eyebrow transplant, we're removing hair from your scalp. And so those hairs are also, we're rehoming them, but they have the same property of what where they once were coming from. So um, sometimes it can affect natural hairs. It can also be just the transplanted hairs um, falling out. It can, you know, in, in the surrounding areas, there's trauma. Um, you know, so that can occur. It all grows back. Um, we can even recommend, um, there are some things that we can recommend now that you're six weeks out. Um, there are some topicals, uh, Latisse, or, uh, which is uh, Latanoprost or Bimatoprost, which we use for eyelashes. Some patients purchase it and pull a spoolie and they can put some on their eyebrows. Um, we can also do some Kenalog injections. So I welcome you to email me. Um, so that we can talk about some options and I'll get some photos. Photos are huge for us um, so that we can kind of get an idea, you know, but that timeline links up and, and it will all come back. Okay. Are any of these treatments covered by insurance? Unfortunately, no. Um, so in the insurance world, hair loss, while very personal to us, is considered aesthetic. 
So none of these treatments are covered by insurance. We don't take insurance in our office. Anything that we can try to do for you, uh, like if I need to do a biopsy or if I order lab work, I do put the insurance codes and I, I run what I can through the insurance, you know, to when Quest and LabCorp so they can see that, you know, I'm a licensed provider and the diagnosis code. But in general, things like I said, like PRP and trico tests and all those things, no, are not covered by insurance, unfortunately. What is the treatment if one has PCOS? I, I don't know how to answer that via this. You know, I'd probably have to see you in consultation. As I mentioned, one of the large portions of consultation is looking at the degree of hair loss, understanding, you know, how long uh, with PCOS patients, the degree of um, hairline widening um, is it differs greatly, right? Um, and what kind of treatments you've already tried, as spironolactone, some patients are on metformin, you know, there are there are different protocols that we have, again, depending on how severe the hair loss is, depending on your age, um, depending on your um, commitment to treatment, if you plan to try and have children, if that's, if you're of childbearing age, there are things that I maybe wouldn't do until that, that window has closed for you, because it can be dangerous should you get pregnant. So there's a, a lot of a lot of options there, but I would love to meet you and, and talk with you a little bit more. Um, heavy metal testing, that's um, in, a, in a functional medicine space. Um, we look at um, blood work to see like um, lead levels and things like that for patients that have a lot of tattoos, that have metal crowns. Um, we invite you to go. There's a website that you can go to um, where you can check like the, the, the metals in your water, in your area to see what kind, you know, if you're using um, like regular tap water or anything. So you want to look at all those things and see if, if um, you know, if you're losing hair, we can't find another reason why. That's one of the things that we recommend that you do. Um, and I think, I think that's it. If no one has any other questions, um, oh, shower filter. I see that now. I know you and I'm going to email it to you because I don't know it off the top of my head. But if you're interested in the shower filter that I mentioned, um, email me and I will get the name for you because there's two different ones depending on the type of shower head that you have. Um, so I probably should have put that in the presentation. I'm sorry. So email me and I will get back to you on that. But it's something you just, you know, like the shower head, you just attach it to that. Um, or you can put it even, you know, there's one that comes with a shower head. If you have like a rain shower head or something fancy, you can, you can adjust it to that or the, the hose as well. So that's something that you might want to consider. So email me and I will get that for you tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I hope that this was informative. If you have any additional, oh, um, is microneedling only done with PRP? No. So for patients, obviously, that are doing it at home, you can do it at home. If you want to just do microneedling in the office, we can come up with a protocol for you for that. Um, even if you do not want to do the PRP, although I do recommend it, we can just do a microneedling session. Or again, you can dermal roll at home. Um, I don't recommend to do it every day by any means. Usually if you're doing maybe once a week, um, if that and depending on if you're adding anything topical to your scalp. Um, is it better to shower with cold water or hot water? Better for your hair is cold. Um, usually, you know, you can shower with lukewarm water in general for your skin and things like that. You should not have scalding water. Um, and then usually you can, you know, finish. You can use some warm water on your hair, you know, and then you want to, you know, seal that in and close it. And nicely at the end of your shower, you should you should do some cold water um, on your hair. And same thing, you know, when you wash your face, you should use, you could use warm water to open up your pores, clean well, and then you want to seal with cold water. All right. Hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Again, my email address is Andrea NP at FHRPS.com. And if you have any questions or anything personal that maybe you didn't want to address um, and you want to see me in consultation, I'm happy to see you either virtually or in person. And for those of my patients that I see on here, thank you for continuing to support me. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with you and any new patients. I hope uh, to see you in the office or virtually soon. Okay. Have a great day.